Hi everyone, my name is Teddy. I'm from the University of Calgary. Uh, so this is one of the projects myself, uh, Dan and Zigdong did last summer around uh, smartwatches. So kind of taking a step back and thinking about smartwatches. So over the last three to four years, there's been a number of smartwatches have, that have been released commercially. So watches from Amazon, for, sorry, from Samsung, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Fitbit. Even on sites like Indiegogo or Kickstarter, there's also a number of smartwatches as well being made by people. So jumping from smartwatches to this funny looking image, um, I think this image kind of really captures one of the main problems with smartwatches today. And that is, we want to be able to do meaningful interactions, so things like answering an email or a text or navigating a map. But we can't really do that because the interaction is very small on a smartwatch. So really what we're looking for on a smartwatch, I think, is a smart smartphone, but on our wrist. So that's kind of what this is showing right here. So given the fact that the touch screen is very small, on a smartwatch, that means input is very, very awkward. So here's a couple of examples with a current smartwatch. So things like navigating a map, kind of annoying. Navigating a huge list of applications, kind of cumbersome. Getting a text and being able to reply requires a secondary device. So our solution, or one potential solution, is to introduce two sort of main things. The first being a dual display, and the second being a tangible interaction. So I'm just going to play you a quick video to introduce the concept of Doppio, and then I'll jump into how we actually came up with this concept, both from the design side and the technical side. So here you can see I rotate the top to switch to an application, such as music. I change the song, switch it back. I can look at a second application underneath. And last but not least, notifications. So being able to open an application directly using an adjacent side. Then using a tangible interaction to change the mode of an application. So I'll play this again really quickly. Changing the top to rotate to change to a song. Using a tangible interaction such as a hinge. And getting a notification and opening up the application directly. So we were kind of influenced by three main work uh, that have been done before. So the first is Codex with the concept of hinging two displays or a tablet. Second being Paddle and its sort of deformability and changing an application. And last but not least is Siftables, sort of the concept of spatial awareness of smaller, uh, smaller displays. We're also kind of influenced by things that are available today. Uh, so these are commercially available uh, watches. Uh, so the first two that you see at the top, these are sort of watches that already hinge. And the bottom one is a watch that actually changes the face. So you can switch to a digital or a mechanical watch. So given the fact that we came up with Doppio, we want to first start with a paper prototype and give this to people to try out. So here you see an example of our paper prototype that we use for a study that I'll explain shortly. Um, so this is basically the size, roughly, of an Apple Watch. It has magnets underneath and cardboard, and these two basically attach and detach uh, separately. So as I mentioned, our first study was essentially exploratory, and so we got people to try out the concept of a dual display watch and look at existing applications. So here you can see people trying out our paper prototype. We also gave them a list of applications to be kind of inspired by how they would use a secondary device for common things that they already do with a smartphone. So from our first study, there was about eight main takeaways. I only have time to talk about two, so I'll talk about them very quickly. So the first is the concept of unified or separate displays. So you need to have both displays adjacent to each other and sort of have one unified input space, or you can separate them and use them for different means. So for example, if I had a map, I could use one hand for input on the secondary display, and the second display on the wrist could be used for output. The second one, which I think is kind of interesting, is this concept of location and tangibility. So for example, if I had the second screen on the right, or sorry, on the right of my hand, and it's closer to my wrist, because my wrist is more flexible, that means I have more space for tangible interaction. However, if it's on the left, because there's no space to move down, it's probably better for things like typing. So from this, we generated about 100 different, 124 different configurations with transitions and manipulations, and I'll explain this. So you can think of a configuration as a starting state. So in this case, we're starting in a stacked configuration. I use the transition to go to another state. So in this case, I'm going to a stacked hinge, where the transition is a tilt, and then I'm going to manipulation, which is a hinge. So I'm hinging to up or down. So a few more quick examples. Slide, so now I'm sliding to the, light, to the right with a peak, looking at information underneath on the first display or I can slide off directly into an adjacent configuration to the right. So obviously there's about 124 of them and I don't have the time to talk about all of them. But instead of showing you pictures, I'll show you a 
few quick videos showing these off. So the first one is the stack configuration. So here the, the top is attached to the base and we're essentially rotating the top in different directions. Next is the stacked hinge as I had shown previously. So here again I'm on the top and I'm going to hinge to the left. And again, because it's four different sides and it's a square, you can do four different sides in four different directions. Next is the stacked peak. So here I'm attached to the top and I'm peaking to the left or to the right, where I'm looking at information underneath. Next is the adjacent configuration, so very, very easily being able to move to the left, to the right, to the top, or the down in adjacent configuration. In this example, you see a sort of visual indication telling you what side that I'm on. Next is the hinge and pivot manipulation. So as I had shown in the diagram, being able to hinge, or in this case, the second one, being able to pivot on the bottom direction. You'll see a visual indication telling you about how much I've hinged or pivoted as well. So here I'm hinging, and then the top sort of gets thicker, and the bottom kind of gets thinner. So that's great. We've had a design space now. We've given it to users. That's really cool. But now, what does it actually mean for people to use these? Are they actually feasible? Are they quick? Can they be actually mapped to applications that people commonly use? So this is kind of the focus of our second study. And for our second study, we implemented a second prototype, very similar to the first, except obviously this has a little bit more wires and sensing in it. So we use magnets to sense which side we're on, and capacitive sensing is combined. This second study was more controlled. So again, we measured things like time and preference for uh, the different interactions. So what it looks like, and I'll show you short, shortly, is we gave people the option to uh, move from one configuration to another. We measure time and speed. So the person was standing, and then we had a, an application running that basically told them from what start state to end state they had, had to go to. So from this, we essentially ran our participants through what we called transition families. So these, these are things like peaking, rotations, and things like that. So what it looked like was being able to go from a stacked position to a stacked uh, north position, which means you're going up, or starting in a stacked west position where the top is rotated to the left, and you're going to the right as a peak. So as again, as I mentioned, we measured things like time. So as you can see with peaks, they're very, very quick, and they were preferred by people. We had over 37 uh, sort of different transitions and configurations in our study. So here's kind of a general sense from the chart. Obviously, there's not going to be enough time to talk about it. So I'll talk about three main takeaways from this study. So the first is times by transition family. So things like rotation and detachments were very slow because they required more movement than things like peak. However, they weren't slow enough that they were considered to be unfeasible for users. Next was transition times. So things like peak were very, very fast. But things like rotation were very heavily dependent on the side you're on. So for example, rotation over here is probably very easy. If it was to be done over here because of the sort of solid part of my wrist, it's very hard. Um, things like preference, speed kind of essentially was correlated to preference. So if it was very fast, that's things that people preferred. If it was very slow, it wasn't as, as impacted. So before I jump into the cool part of the presentation where we actually show these off, I'll kind of show you how we actually built this. So we used magnets, which essentially did the attachment to Android smartwatches, a custom 3D printed cases, and then in Arduino that basically merged all the sensor information from all the different devices. Okay, so one of the common things that we do with smartwatches now is notifications. So here's a few examples of using the Doppio concept for not uh, notifications. So being able to do a thing like a rotate to the left or to the right to turn off notifications or using sort of a closed state to kind of mute the notifications entirely. So I'll play these again. To the left, to turn off or on notifications. And a closed state to mute notifications. Next is this concept of uh, managing multiple notifications. So what happens if two comes up? How do you manage that? So here you're going to see multiple notifications comes up, and I'm going to save one and discard the other. So the first one's going to come up, and the next one's going to come up. 
I'm quickly going to slide down to look at it and dismiss it. The next time, I'm actually going to tap the display and hold it to save it. So I'll play this again. So the first two are going to come up. I slide down to look at it very quickly, dismiss it, and I'll tap again to save it. This one is kind of my favorite just because it's kind of like the Inspector Gadget GoGo Watch um, where you're kind of using a second display. So let's say I get a sort of a private notification of email. I'm using the second display kind of as a hidden way of looking at information, I'm not letting people see it. Now I deem that it's not important, so I can then open the email up directly. <laughs> Next is this concept of launching an application directly. So earlier I showed you the text message coming up and then requiring a secondary device to open the application. So here I'm actually going to open the application directly from notification. And I'm just going to use an adjacent side. So notification comes up and I put it to the right. Next is managing systems and settings, so being able to use peaks to the left or to the right to manage them. So quick peek to the left to look at the alarm or quick peek to the right to look at battery life. Next is managing applications. So if you have you use a smartwatch now, you know that you have to basically download other apps to manage uh, your smartwatch. So here I'm going to basically show you how to use tangible interactions, things like peaking and hinging to manage multiple applications to switch between them very easily. So now I'm going to rotate to switch to a running app. I have a secondary application running on the next screen. I'll tap it to switch. Now that I see it's on the top, and I can rotate back. So here I'm going to show you an example of using shortcuts for applications. So instead of navigating a list, you can rotate to the left or to the right to open up applications very directly. So I rotate to the left to open up one list. Rotate to the right to open up another list. If I want to expand my list, I can place it adjacently and then open the application directly. Now I'm going to jump into kind of the applications that we have built um, using some of the results that we talked about earlier. So the first one is very quick, and it's the weather application. I'm going to use adjacent sides to open up different parts of an application. So I'll show you an example of weather in one city versus weather in my city. So placing it on the bottom will give me the weather forecast for my city, and on the top will be weather of other, of other cities. Next is the mapping application that I kind of talked about earlier. I'm using one hand for input and one for out dedicated output. So I can navigate a map with a unified display, or I can detach that second display and use one as input and one as output. And next, I can use really quick peaks, as I mentioned before, to do things like increase or decrease volume, or increase speed or decrease speed of a video. So the last one is the Photos application. This one is kind of my favorite just because it's kind of introducing something I think kind of novel to uh, wearable devices, and this is the concept of sharing. So here you're going to see a, the person detach the first display and hand it to me. Each time she does that, it's going to be a little bit different. So the first time she's going to navigate the list of photos, and she's going to detach it with a touch. She then hands it to me. I'm now able to navigate the list of photos myself independently. Now she's going to do the same thing, except when she detaches it, she's not going to be able to touch the screen. And now you notice I won't be able to actually navigate the information. So now it's sort of sharing, but it's now private to the display, as opposed to public as earlier. So, so far in this talk, I've kind of explained to you the design space, the applications we built, and what it meant in terms of transition times and families and things like that. But obviously there's a bit of more work to be done for Doppio. Um, so kind of on the design side, um, obviously, you've, you've seen the prototype already and how thick it is. 
Um, that's obviously something we want to change for the next time, so obviously limiting the, the tech. Um, lastly, for the design side is the battery life. It was not very good because we're using Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, so obviously that's something that will change. On the design side, we only really looked at uh, square shapes. Obviously, if we looked at circular ones, there's probably different interactions that we could use. Um, and last but not least is an alternative design. So in our original prototype for Dapio that we had drawn up, we wanted a dual-face, dual-sided top screen. Um, but obviously, we couldn't do that because of the thickness of the watch. So that's something we'd like to explore next. So the main takeaways of the work that I presented to you today are first, we explored the design space of a dual-display tangible watch. which is reconfigurable. Um, we didn't want to focus too much on how thick it was. It was more about the exploration and what it actually meant for users. And last but not least is we kind of tried to show how this would actually enhance smartwatch interactions. We're not claiming this is the best way of doing it, but this is one way of doing it that we think could be effective. So that's it for me. Thank you. I'm open to questions. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah. I'm Alex Olwell from Google. Uh, so really, a really interesting, like, creative uh, exploration of the design space. I was think, wondering a little bit if you can comment on, uh, I mean, like, a lot of these interactions are based on... Um, like all these hints and affordances that you get from like the tangible prototype. And I was wondering how much of this could you achieve with either using the touch screen to rotate and like simulate uh, uh, like the, the flipping and all these things um, with graphics or even have like displays that are more attached like in, in a sort of like more elastic fashion so you don't have like the, uh, the movable parts, like the, the separate parts, which is obviously uh, like a mechanical challenge. Yeah, so one of our sorry, one of our other designs, we actually had a sort of a sort of an elastic band on the side that was kind of attached. We weren't doing too much of the, the hinge, but we kind of we felt this was a more interesting way to do to to approach it. Um, and this is kind of one of the things that we saw in our first prototype, where people were actually doing this more than than really worried about too much of the graphics or things like that. Okay, and, and what do you think in terms of simulating some of these with uh, just on a display, but you sort of have. Uh, some of the same similar gestures or motions uh, with, you know, with your fingers on a touch screen or with some other types of input control. So that's something that you looked at or you're planning to look at uh, uh, as I an alternative implementation. Yeah, I think that'd be something really cool to explore. Um, I know for myself, I really like the aspect of being able to move a physical device around on your wrist. And I don't know if you'd be able to do things like detach and give a photo to someone as well with something like that. So, but that's something we could definitely explore. All right. And Thank we could you. if you want to. Thanks. Hey. Uh, Daniel Gomes, Human Media Lab, Queen's University. I'll follow up in the previous question, um, and I'll start with another question. Are you familiar with uh, Display Skin? Yes. Um, so with that in mind, can you tell me a little bit about the design rationale? Um, because a lot of the interaction techniques that you demonstrated uh, still rely on sequential uh, navigation techniques that we have with smartphones. Did you consider instead what would have been the, the benefits of exploring body posture instead of having to physically manipulate something that's on your wrist, which I would assume poses a little bit of drawbacks for interactions on the go. That's one of the benefits of smartwatches. Yeah, I mean, so we, our approach, as I mentioned before, was to really kind of narrow down existing smartwatches approaches and the challenges they had, so things like smaller displays and kind of improve on that. Um, we didn't worry too much about things like the graphic or typing speed or things like that. We just really wanted to focus on the smartwatch, which is why we kind of worried more about that than... Thank you.